Kia ora e te whanau. my name is Hannah Nanset. I'm joining you from the Institute of Building as Project Lead. Uh, really nice to have you guys along for Industry Insights today. I am joined by two um, construction recruitment professionals at Hayes Recruitment. I'm going to hand over to Amy to give us a spiel about Hayes and a little bit about herself. Thanks, Amy. Hey, Laura. Thank you very much, Hannah. Um, yes, yeah, so Laura and I, we both work for Hayes Recruitment. Um, Hayes is a global recruiting company. Um, we operate in 33 countries worldwide, um, but we've been in the New Zealand market for just over 20 years now. Um, we have offices in Auckland, Wellington and Christchurch, and we've got a satellite office in Tauranga where we serve sort of the local markets. Um, Laura and myself specialise within the construction division. Um, I've been with Hayes since 20, no, I'll get that right, 2001, actually, I think it's a very long time, um, and always worked within that period, um, within that construction field. So I started off in that London office, moved to our Melbourne office, and currently based in our Auckland office. Um, changed a lot over those years, I guess, in terms of how to present your CV, how to apply for jobs from when I very first started, um, but some of the key fundamentals are still the same. Um, and yeah, Laura and I are sort of looking forward to talking you through those today. Um, Laura, I'll pass over to you to introduce yourself. Thanks, Amy. Kia ora, everyone. My name is Laura Le Saanga. You know, you go by Laura. Um, I've been with Hayes almost, I would say, two years now and been in the construction industry recruiting for white-collar construction um, during my entire time here. Um, so quite well embellished in terms of the market and um, I'm quite excited, really, to talk about the fundamentals of job seeking, um, especially with the current um, sort of climate that we're in. Um, there's quite a lot of movement within this industry as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Laura. Uh, as you both uh, alluded to, I think this is a hot topic right now, not only for people starting out uh, in their careers, but for people who have been affected by um, job changes or if they are just looking for a change. So really excited to um, have this chat with you guys today and, and sort of learn about things that can people can put in their backpack when preparing for, for the next role. Uh, so just to tell people who are joining us today, we're going to be covering five uh, essential items. Um, first one being uh, CVs and cover letters, which is crucial and a crucial first step, I would imagine. Um, and then uh, we'll be talking about um, how to plan your job search um, and discovering a hidden job market, standing out from the crowd and um, how to work with job agencies. Uh, third one is getting prepped for the big day, which I imagine is a very much a key step in putting yourself forward um, and, and um, putting forward your A game. And then um, the most important thing, surely, that everyone wants to hear about is getting the right salary um, and then um, and how you get out. Um, and crafting the right resignation and ending on good terms. So I think these five points um, are going to cover start to finish. And um, yeah, I think people are going to find some some really good tips and tricks uh, for how to end potentially uh, where they're at at the moment, but what to look forward to in the next um, part of their journey. So let's start things off um, with you, Amy, talking about CVs and cover letters. Where do people begin? Yeah, thank you. Um, so as you said, CV and cover letters are critical. And they're your sort of first opening personal pitch to get yourself in front of a potential employer. Um, and it really is your first impressions that you're making. So you've got to make sure that everything is right. Um, you've People look at CVs quite quickly, and if I'm honest, do make quite a quick judgment. So we've just got to make sure we've got all the key information there. Um, so starting at the real basics, I guess, the first thing you do want is your contact details and your name, um, and make sure they're right. We do sometimes see CVs with the incorrect contact details, and we can't follow up. Um, so you just want to start off with your name, your contact details. You don't need to go into too many details about your date of birth or anything else. Um, they're just the key things you need to have there. Um, you then want to move on to a opening statement or a personal profile. 
And that's your hook really to try and get people to read the rest of your CV. So you need to have probably about th only about three sentences, but something that really drives people through to reading your CV. So something about your experience, something about your university degree, qualifications, um, and something about your intention and where you want to go with your career that makes people want to keep reading about you. So you've got your name and your personal details, you've got your career, your sort of personal profile and summary. You then want to go on to your education. Um, again, for education, you want to keep this as relevant and as precise as possible. So if you've got a tertiary degree, that's probably all you need to put on your CV and any further education after your tertiary qualification. You don't need to go back into your high school education. If you've completed education, obviously, at high school, then you do want your high school and your most recent qualifications to be there. After your education, obviously, we go through to your experience. Um, you want to put as much as you can in your experience that's relevant for the job you're applying for. Now, it's obviously a lot easier if you've worked within the industry. It's sometimes a little bit more tricky if it's your first job you're going to within an industry. Um, you want your experience to be in chronological order. So you want your most recent experience at the top and going back towards your sort of first experience. Um, ideally, if you've got some industry experience, you want to be putting as many facts as you can. So facts about your projects, maybe um, what the project value was, what the details were about the project. Um, if you don't have industry experience yet, then you want to be just trying to show as many transferable skills as possible that you've gained from what you've got. Um, it's really easy to write the buzzwords, I suppose, like, you know, good communicator or good team player. You want to try and give examples to back up what you're saying. So you could, you know, like I, I work well in a team and I collaborated with X, Y and Z whilst I was doing this. Or I've got really strong communication skills and I presented here. You just want to make sure you're really backing up everything you're saying with facts um, and real life examples. I think one of the keys as well at the moment is a lot of CVs um, are run through sort of AI algorithm programs. Um, so you want to make sure you've got all your keywords in there. So if it's going through an AI system, they're picking you up. So if you've got any computer packages you can use, if you can use AutoCAD, if you can use Vism, um, if you've got project management experience, if you've got construction experience, if you've got site experience, everything needs to be on your CV and really clear as a keyword. So if a computer system's running through that CV and looking for the keyword, it's finding you. Um, and you can help make sure you've got the right words by referring back to a job description or adverts and looking for what the key attributes they're looking for, making sure that's covered off in your CV. Um, your CV really needs to be two pages long. Any longer does become a little bit too long. Um, if you've got significant experience in the industry, then potentially you can go to three pages, particularly if you're looking for one of your first roles out of university, then you know you do want to try and mix it out at two pages. So you need to be concise whilst, as I said earlier, sort of giving real life examples. To complement your CV, some, some jobs require a cover letter. They're not always required, and it will often say in the job application if a cover letter is needed. Um, in a cover letter, you don't want to be just repeating everything you've put in your CV. You want to be really selling yourself for this particular role and this particular company. So you want to do a little bit of research and take a little bit of time on it. Um, you probably want three paragraphs in a cover letter, the first being a little bit more of a summary about yourself, so really, really just a key summary of you, and that will be a bit repetitive from your CV. But then you want to be addressing some of the core competencies or requirements in a job, the job specification and relating that back to your own experience. Um, and again, in your cover letter, you want to be as detailed as possible in terms of giving specific examples of projects or times you've worked as a team or times you've worked towards a deadline, whatever the competencies that are being looked at, um, you want to make sure that you're sort of drawing on those in your cover letter and you want to tailor it to the company. So you want to name the company. You want to put in your final paragraph why you want to work for that company. So picking something out from maybe the company's website or the job spec about that why that company is right for you um, and just make it feel that you've really taken some time out to do this. 
I think it goes without saying for CV and cover letters, obviously spell checking, we do see spelling mistakes. <laughs> um, there's also formatting. We often see CVs where maybe people have copied and paste, pasted different things in and they're coming up with different type fonts. Just take some time to sit back, print it out and look at it. And is it all with the same um, type font? Have I used bullet points? You can use bold to highlight sort of keywords you want. Um, it's very tempting, I know, to maybe put your CV through a, a, an AI program, a chat GPT or something like that. Um, but it is often very obvious to recruiters when a CV has, hasn't been written by a person. Um, so by all means, maybe use those resources to help you, but keep your own flavor and your own tone of voice in your CV and cover letter because it sells you as being sort of unique and different. Um, so yeah, so sort of to summarize, I think it's, it's keeping it concise, but also relevant and using examples. Um, and we do have on our website, I think links will be shared later, but we have got um, some templates for CVs and some templates and cover letters that you can refer to, to help you. So I hope that answers the question, Hannah. Thanks, Amy. And yes, as you were talking, I was kind of thinking of the questions that I wanted to ask and and one was around templates, because um, I guess if you are just starting off where you, where you begin, and I guess, you know, for a lot of people starting on chat, GBT is probably, you know, uh, where they think they should start. But as you say, um, you know, it, it comes out very generic. Um, my other question, Amy, is around, I know that there's um, all the rage at the moment is getting a CV writer. Um, is this something that you think is necessary in terms of, yeah, putting your best foot forward? Yeah. No, I don't personally. I think you know yourself best. Um, I also think particularly in the industry we work in, maybe for other industries, potentially for our industry, it's very much driven on sort of key competencies. And if you have experience, project experience. Um, and I think providing you follow a basic template, you know yourself the best to sell yourself. Um, yeah. So I wouldn't recommend spending the money. Um, you can also, you know, Laura and I often help people with CVs too, and that's a free service we can offer. So you can always reach out to a recruiter um, and they can give you some guidance and some pointers if it's if you're missing the mark somewhere. Um, and we'll always be happy to do that. Thanks, Amy. And one final question around this. Um, does a CV have to be flashy dashy, graphic design, um, or is simple kind of the best best way forward? No. Simple is the best way forward. Put your effort into your content and thinking of working yeah. examples rather than bells and whistles. Yeah. Just a plain white aerial font is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you don't need to go all out on that. Good to know. And we're now going to go to uh, Laura about getting creative and um, planning the job search. So I'll pass the baton over to you, Laura, to talk us through that. Thanks, Hannah. And thanks, Amy. That was actually really great. Um, just mentioned CVs and cover letters. So um, I'll be covering off the getting creative part. And to start that off really is really just planning out your search on where you wanna go, whether as a seasoned professional or even as a new grad. Um, so the first thing is really planning out where or what your next opportunity would be. And there's usually about four, or, well, the cover, the steps that I'll cover is about four um, that you need to consider before really getting into that planning. Um, so the first is really to reflect upon what you want um, and where you see yourself long-term. You really need to dig deep and kind of ask yourself like where you see yourself in the next 10 years. And if you're a new grad, um, what have you studied? What area of that that you found interesting and try and match that to the market that you're trying to go into? Um, what jobs or opportunities that you think will bridge the gap to reach your ultimate goal or your 10 year plan, five year plan, whatever you are looking for as a senior professional or as a new grad. And then as some, if, if you are someone that are looking to go into a new industry, you can reflect back on your time on what you've done in your career that you're proud of and what you'd like to invest in. Um, and then just have a look around and see where you'd like to progress or like to further develop those skills. 
Um, and then once you've really had a reflection upon yourself and where you see yourself, you do need to define, that's the next step is to define your next move. Um, and that is what um, duties and experience you'd need to match that up. So what role best represents the next sensible step for you? Um, what skills do you need to develop for your next role? Um, what um, do I want out of a job, whether that's progression or project-wise um, for the construction industry that you want to go into? Um, and then also things that are quite important on the softer skill side, like what kind of culture do I work best in as a seasoned professional or um, even doing a bit of research within the networking industry for construction, because it is quite small on certain, um, I guess, reputation wise for each, con in each contractor or different consultancies as well, because there will be someone that will know something. And I think NZIOB as well does the mentoring program. Um, so there's quite a lot of resources around that. Um, and then your next step is really getting to work and, and actioning sort of everything that you've come to as a reflection on what your next step would be. And that is first and foremost, updating your CV and LinkedIn profile. Um, so using the steps and tools that Amy's just spoken about to really um, stand out in the market. And even LinkedIn has really changed sort of the networking aspect of that as well as really having an eye-catching sort of summary um, on your profile to make sure that it does stand out and prospective, you know, talent acquisition, um, people within construction will be able to reach out and um, other companies as well would be able to read that and it'll be a clear reflection of what you are on the lookout for um, and what you can bring to a company in terms of, um, you know, the value that you would be able to add. Um, and then next is really down to planning on the tasks that you'll, you'll try to cover off for your job search. So it's important to break down into small actionable tasks. This is especially for grads in terms of being on the lookout there. Um, you'd want to identify at least five prospective employers um, and if, have a look around on their website or even on the job board, see if they are um, actively recruiting. Um, and then you'd also want to schedule a meeting with a recruiting expert, whether it be um, Case. Um, and then even using your network, like I said, with LinkedIn, um, there are a lot of tools that would help you to try and secure something. Um, and then that leads me into, I guess, the, the next point of the hidden job market that we have been talking about. So most recent figures um, that we've had available to us is that uh, we found that one in seven organizations didn't advertise a vacancy recently. Um, nearly a third um, use about word of mouth signal job opening. So they usually go to their own employees because they know your company best. Do you know anyone that would be able to work with us or would mirror our values? And then a quarter of organizations use LinkedIn and Seek. And then um, only about 15% have used a recruitment company. Um, when looking for a new role, a lot of job seekers tend to solely rely on social media like LinkedIn, um, Seek, Train Me Jobs, for example. Um, along the thing you need to consider is that's where everyone else is looking as well. So you do need to be a bit savvy, especially in the market that we are in, um, to try and identify opportunities yourself. Um, and there's a few ways that you can do that. First thing you'd want to do is reach out to your network. If you are a seasoned professional, um, especially in our industry within construction, um, everyone kind of knows everyone. You can ask for referrals or um, like I said, with word of mouth for, for hiring, you can also do the same in terms of your search um, and leverage on colleagues or um, previous consultancies that you've worked with because they will be aware of your experience and you have worked with them before. Um, and you'd also kind of have an internal reference that way as well. They could help support your search. Um, for recent grads, I strongly recommend as well, um, sort of using the LinkedIn tool function. Um, and that could be really just mapping out a company, which I will cover later. The next thing that you could do to discover the hidden um, job market is reaching out to a recruiter. 
So the reason why you'd want to do that is, for example, in construction and myself and Amy, um, we have quite a wide network ourselves of hiring managers. And rather than um, kind of sitting in a pool from those job adverts where it is quite saturated at the moment, um, we can help you to reach those hiring managers a lot more quickly. Um, and we are out there sort of in the market all the time as well, meeting with clients, getting to know what they'd be on the lookout for. So you can also leverage on our knowledge on, sorry, our knowledge within the market of certain personalities that would fit with certain companies and what they look out for in terms of specialties and certain roles that some companies would find quite hard to recruit for as well. Um, and they wouldn't advertise those um, on Seek or Trade Me. Usually it's more so that they're waiting for um, the right kind of experience and then they'd be open to meeting that person. So there is um, sort of an internal network that we'd be able to tap into. Um, and on top of that, with reaching out to a recruiter, you could also get, like Amy said, advice on CVs and how to stand out more um, within that job ad pool that, um, sorry, companies would look through. The next thing you can do is research the companies, the five that you've identified you want to work for, have a look through on um, what I call mapping it out. Um, usually for the large organizations, there's a HR team or a talent acquisition manager that you can just chat to um, and really use the selling point that you would have um, on your CV as a summary or certain projects that you have been across or certain things that you've done in your studies that highlight what could be of value to their company um, and really just reaching out to see if they would have any interest in meeting because more often than not, that would make you stand out a lot in the market is reaching out and just saying, hey, I, I do have an expression of interest. I've either heard of you from a reputable company or in terms of what you're like in the market, that's why I've approached with certain skill set that I have. Um, and then the next thing you want to do is also um, stay on top of the news in terms of being a lot more savvy in your job search. So not just construction, but across the board, um, there's usually something that's happening in, in, in each industry that could indicate certain companies are a lot more busier. So they could, they could be potentially on the lookout for new talent skills. Um, and then just approaching it, like I said, with those organizations there. Um, if you have approached that company and there isn't um, availability or, or any opportunities there, it doesn't hurt to ask for a referral. Um, so you can always just say, look, that's completely fine. Um, I appreciate you taking your time, but if you are aware of someone that could be interested in my skill set, could you please let me know or please pass on my details? Um, because people do want to help more often than not, and you could um, secure yourself something that way. Um, the next thing is really, I'll, I'll just touch on this because of, I think I brought it, I thought I brought it up just because of the market at the moment is really being persistent. Um, like it, it is quite tough in terms of recruitment, but if you do stay in contact with the company, you never know what does change, especially in our industry and construction, um, a lot changes overnight. So if you have approached um, like the company directly, they could always, you, you'd be in front of mind essentially. So if an opportunity were to pop up, they could always reach out to you again and say, actually, we've had this come up. Um, so. It, being tough is just if you do get a no don't take it personally it's usually the market that's driven that's driving it and not you um, but if you are persistent sorry persistent across that um, more often than not it'll increase your your likelihood to try and secure something new um, and then the next thing that I wanted to touch on was just uh, how to stand out from other job seekers and I think Amy has covered quite a lot of that um, for writing a great resume and writing a great CV and cover letter to really match that up with, I guess, job ads or what specifically keywords that you could include. Um, but the next thing you could do uh, in terms of if you've reached out to a company is, is selling yourself essentially on your skill set and your knowledge base and what you have done. Um, why should I hire you is a common job interview question um, that a lot of companies do ask 
and you want to highlight one or two unique selling points that differentiate yourself from the crowd, whether it be you're a seasoned professional or a recent grad, you could reflect back on projects and what you've done to turn it around or things that you've done as a team um, to achieve certain goals or achieve um, like an award that you've won that you've included in your um, CV. As a grad, you could also um, include what you've done throughout your studies on top of um, you know getting your bachelor's or anything uh, for work experience over summer because that would show that you are kind of different from the rest. Um, and then just tie that into why that makes you passionate about that company and why you think it would be a good matchup for you. Um, next would be, uh, I guess, your experience, anything that you as a seasoned professional or if you are in the industry um, would make you different from anyone else, albeit project value or seeing, seeing something through from the entire life cycle of the construction phase. Um, that could really help because a lot of prospective employers do um, tend to look for people that have industry knowledge and can hit the ground running um, if they were actively hiring. And then the next is, is really just showing that you are um, developing new skills and you're keeping on top of your market industry as well. For example, you could talk about um, the changes in the 3910 contract so that they are aware that you're on top of your own market and you try to, to actively change and pivot with where everything else in the industry is going. Um, and then something to make you stand out as well is just research of the organization. Um, and then, sorry, because a lot of companies do tend to ask, what do you know about us? If you are reaching out to them in that hidden job, job market, um, you want to be able to answer that as, as to not just, um, oh, well, I'm on the lookout for a role. You want to match that up with things that you found valuable, albeit from the website or even posts on their LinkedIn that they've highlighted or who they partner up with um, as a company and how that reflects with you. Um, because then that could show that you are actually interested in the company and you want to be a part of that and be a part of their core values as well. Um, and I think this next one would be um, more targeted for the next of actually securing an interview. So I will pass that back to Hannah for any questions and then Amy will cover off um, that part. Thanks, Laura. Um, that was such a great summary, I felt, of um, a lot of um, sort of nervousness around things. I think you were able to give people a bit of insight as to how to, to tackle those um, those concerns. And one of the things that kept playing in my mind as you were talking about it was something that I think a lot of people feel, especially early on in the career, is you know, when you when you leave university, you're leaving with hundreds of other people who are in that job market at the exact same time as you are. And I thought you know, you gave a lot of kind of um, tips on how to stand out, but I thought the one that stood out to me most was around researching um, and, you know, being knowledgeable on stuff like 3190, you know, because that that will make you stand out and that's what people want and need in, in new employees, right, to have some understanding of what they're getting themselves into rather than just going straight from university paper into, into a role, having that a bit more uh, understanding and knowledge um, that they can bring, bring to the role. So um, yeah, thank you, Laura. I thought that was a really, really good summary um, and very helpful. Now, um, as you said, Laura is a bit of a lead on um, into getting prepped for the big day, which Amy will talk us through, um, which is, I guess, another way that you can stand out amongst the crowd if you can get your foot in the door, right? Yeah, exactly. I think it's one of the first steps getting your foot in and then it's making sure you're the one that gets that role. Yeah. Um, very similar to what Laura sort of touched on and Hannah just sort of brought up then. The key thing before you go to your interview is your research and your preparation. You want to walk in there feeling confident and knowledgeable about what you're going to be talking about. And I think that will sort of help you perform better. Um, in terms of your research, you know, 
as just again similar as very similar to what Laura said you really want to be researching the organization so not just their website everyone looks at the website like google them what projects have they worked on what have they been in the news for what look at the people that work for the company on LinkedIn what are their backgrounds what are they well known for um, so you really feel like you know the company have a look at the culture pages of the company have a look at the company's LinkedIn profile and you'll see sort of some of the things that maybe they do different initiatives they support maybe different charities they support just so you get a whole feel of not just the black and white of the company um, so you want to prepare yourself by researching for the company Likewise, again, to what Laura said, you want to prepare yourself about the industry, making sure you are aware of what's going on in the industry, what's happening in the news, so you're sounding and presenting yourself as a knowledgeable person. Um, you know, anything, any incidents recently that have happened, any big developments, any new big projects, any changes that are coming about, just make sure you're fully aware of those that you can relate back to them. So that's sort of some of the generic research. Um, you also need to research and prepare yourself based on the job description. Um, so a bit like what I was talking about with the CVs, you need to go back through it. You need to look at all the core competencies and really prepare yourself with examples to demonstrate how you have um, how you've used any of these core competencies in the past and thinking of examples um, to show and demonstrate those skills. There's a couple of sort of common questions that come up. Um, so one of the first opening questions often for an interview, and it's meant to be to sort of put you at ease but you know it's good to prepare yourself for it it's sort of just tell me about you or tell me your story um for that question you want to give a summary of yourself but also throw in something about you that makes you unique that makes you different that maybe aligns you culturally to the company if you've seen on the company that i don't know maybe they've done a sponsored bike ride recently for a charity and you love cycling you know something like that you could just throw in at this stage just to sort of show your alignment not just on skills but on that cultural side as well. Um, other key questions that are often asked during the process are why did you apply? A bit like what Laura said, you don't want to just say, well, I'm, I'm looking for work, I, I need a job. Think about something about the company. Think about your reasons for actually wanting to work and grow your career within this company. Um, and also you've got the sort of question of why should I hire you, which Laura sort of touched on again. And that's again, pulling out both those softer competencies and your technical ability and your education ability. Um, so you'll have those more generic questions. A lot of companies also um, use behavioral or competency-based questions. And this is something to think about before you go on your interview. There is quite a technique around answering behavioral or competency-based questions. Um, so a behavioral or competency-based question could be something that starts with the line, tell me about a time or describe a situation. Um, the technique that we really recommend using for answering these questions, which is a common technique, is called the STAR technique. Um, so basically, the S stands for situation. The T stands for task, so what you want to accomplish. The A is the approach, and the R is the results you got. It does take a bit of practice, and you probably want to do this at home with a few different questions and sort of think your way through how you would answer them. Um, but for an example, if someone said to you, sort of tell me about a challenge you faced at work, um, your situation could be, I was a project manager and the budget got cut halfway through the project. The task, you wouldn't obviously say task, but the task, what you had to do was to find a way that you could um, deliver on the project within the restrained budget. Your approach would be something you could say something along the lines of like I, I met with the team we looked at areas where maybe we could review contracts and negotiate areas that maybe we could cut and then you want to talk about your result so your result is we completed the project on time and we managed to make it with budget um, and the client gave us more work or something like that it is quite a technique thinking it through and I would really recommend and particularly if you've got a friend you could practice with um sort of throwing each other a few questions. Um, but it is a technique, but once you get in the habit of using that technique, it actually helps you answer questions quite comprehensively in an interview. So you're really setting the scene, really telling them what you did, and then really telling them what your result was. Um, another key bit of advice I give, and particularly to people that are going straight from university 
um, is to make sure we use the word I. We're very much working, particularly at university, in a collaborative environment. A lot of the work you do as a team, your projects are often team driven. Um, and the feedback we sometimes get is that people talked a lot about what we did. So we worked on this project. We did this. They want to know what you did and what your responsibility was. So you can talk in a broader picture, like we worked on this project, but my role in this project, or I was responsible for X, Y, and Z within a university project. And just really pulling out what you did um, rather than what your whole team did. Um, it's often very hard to take credibility for what you did. So you really want to push what your role was and how you managed to succeed on what you brought to a project rather than what you did as a team. Um, the final thing that I think really stumbles people often is the questions. People will always ask, finish an interview with, do you have any questions? Um, and again, that's something you do want to think about in advance. Um, Questions can be sort of large scale. So you can maybe ask them what impact maybe a trend in the industry is having on their company at the moment. Um, a lot of people talk about sort of the economy and how is that affecting your company? What is your project pipeline? And then you can ask also more personal questions. So what would a typical day look like for a graduate? Or what would a typical day look like for a project manager? Um, tell me a little bit about your team and their backgrounds. T ask for examples of people in the business that have started at your level and where are they now? So you can get a picture of where maybe the career progression could be. Um, so there's a lot of different things you can ask, but I think it's taking time beforehand to prepare because you, I know people sort of get quite nervous. You get to the end of the interview and it's a bit like, oh gosh, I've done it. And then you don't have those questions. Um, questions not to generally ask in the first stage particularly is around flexibility. Let that conversation come up. Um, we don't recommend talking about salary in a first stage interview either. Again, let that come through over time. Um, and just anything that sounds overly demanding, you just want to make yourself sound engaged and wanting to be there. And then there's the real basics, I guess, to interview. So dress code, it sounds silly, but you do hear of people sort of turning up straight from the beach or something to an interview. You need to be professional. You need to be dressed for your job um, to be on time generally recommend people not being there more than 10 minutes early because that does often fluster people as well the interviewers if if they're not in the headspace yet and then they start worrying about you and so just you know if you're more than 10 minutes early go grab a coffee go for a walk around the block to calm your nerves or something like that um, if it is an online teams interview which are getting more and more common particularly first stage again it's those real basics of making sure you're not going to have distractions from friends or pets or kids or making sure your background's tidy, you can't see, I don't know, a messy kitchen behind you or something like that, and treating it like a normal interview. Um, but I think the main thing is just to remember everyone has been in an interview before. So that person that's interviewing you at one stage was sat in your seat being interviewed themselves. So as daunting as it is, people are always feel you because you've always been in that situation and they want you to succeed and they want to see the best out of you. So it's Easy to say, but try not to let nerves get the better of you. I think that's a really good way to end that section, Amy, because, you know, I'm sure a lot of, especially graduates or people in the kind of midst of their career may be going for a step up. It's that nervousness of, you know, am I good enough for this role? Do I stack up to potentially the person who's been in the seat before or will be after? But as you say, it's it's that preparation, it's making sure that um, you can say your answers with confidence. Um, and yeah, I thought they were really good tips. And, you know, so long as you do your research, do your preparation, there's no reason to say that, you know, I mean, nerves are, are a part of, and it's actually good to be nervous because it shows you want it, right? But that people have been in that position before. I think that's a really good point to think when you're sitting there sweating, you know. <laughs> <laughs> We've all done it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, Amy covered tips and tricks, and one of the tips was to not talk about um, salary at uh, one of the first meet and greets, but um, that will come up, obviously, after that. And... Um, I think, Laura, you're going to tell us a little bit about how you can talk about the money, honey. 
Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um so salary is definitely a very, very, very important topic, right? Especially with the rising cost of living in New Zealand, um, and quite a lot of things that are happening within the market. Um there's quite a few things that you can do to benchmark um, sort of what you should expect um, in the salary for a certain role that you're going for. Um, and we do have a comprehensive um, pay salary guide. So we run an annual review um, of the market, not just for construction, but also for other specialties as well within the industry. Um, where we give um, comprehensive insights on what the market is like at the moment and where we're seeing that benchmark salary fall in for certain roles. Um, so definitely, and we will link this, I think, afterwards, just so that you could have a look. Um, I strongly recommend having a look at them um, and then just reading through why um, certain things are benchmarked that way. Um, a few things that you could also fall back on um, and Things that you should consider as well um, what, when you're considering the salary is um, speaking to a recruitment consultant. So again, this ties back to leveraging in on our knowledge for the current market. Um, it's a lot more of, I guess, live insight um, because we do speak with um, our clients quite comprehensively on what they would look for um, in certain salaries for certain roles. And we can give you advice on um, if you are currently in a job um, and you tell us what your current salary is, we can tell you like, okay, that does look like it's either in the market or not, or within the ranges that we work with. Um, or if not, we can kind of guide you through conversations on what that would look like with your current manager. Because ideally we'd want you to have the tools to be able to I guess, talk through what that is. For job seekers, um, especially for professionals that are looking to go into something new um, and you have no knowledge of what that specific role is like and how much that would be, I guess, valued for, there is sometimes some alterations, like you could be going from somewhere senior to start a new passion, and then we'd be able to advise you on what that looks like if it's more realistic for you. Um, and then for young grads, um, we could give you, I guess, some insight on what the current starting rates are um, for the roles within um, not just construction, but other specialties as well. Um, but that Hayes salary guide is something that you could definitely um, refer back to. Um, and then a few other things to consider within um, the job search for salary is considering your experience. You do need to have realistic expectations of what um, the salary is and also consider the market as well. Um, if you are in current employment, um, you need to consider the years that you've been in the construction industry or any industry in general, um, what certain skills or projects and highlights that you've done throughout your, um, throughout your time at your um, company that would justify, I guess, what the desired salary would be. Because um, it's more so you have to tie back into why that certain bracket is what you're looking out for. Um, another thing is you could also ask your network if you are um, working alongside um, same similar, I guess, industries with your counterparts, then you can always ask them um, because then that will give you a general feel um, of how you tie in with other colleagues. Um, another thing that you can do, which is a really good tip, is you could research advertise salaries for your role. Um, so if you have a look on Seek, if you're on, if you're quite active on there on LinkedIn, um, ads that are posted up generally have a salary banding as well. So that could be a good benchmark for you on what that goes for. Or even as a job seeker, um, you'd be able to see what banding they'd work with and whether that would work alongside your expectations as well. Um, and then the last thing as a um, seasoned professional, you really want to consider your current package. Um, I know um, salary is quite a, quite a big reason for a lot of people moving on for new roles. Um, but more often than not, in terms of where you are at, you need to consider everything as a whole um, rather than kind of just the dollar value. Another thing that has 
been a big motivator for people is company culture in terms of moving on. So you also need to consider what the environment that you're in um, in terms of what that company offers. Um, so when we say consider the full package, it's also um, not just the money dollar, but also the overall investment that they're putting into you. Um, but as a job seeker actively out there, I would highly recommend um, our salary guide. And then I will pass on to Amy to talk about counter offers and what that looks like. Yeah, I mean, if you are leaving one job for another job, obviously um, there is a counter offer situation that sometimes occurs. Um, and that is where your current company will offer you more money to stay. Um, and it is common um, and it is also obviously very flattering. I think when it happens, you just have to always reflect back on your motivations for moving. Um, I mean, one of the key things Laura and I always say is if money is your only motivator, go back and have that conversation with your boss anyway before you start looking for work. Um, you just really need to reflect on why you wanted to leave. Money can be flattering, but just check it's still meeting your career aspirations and your career goals and where you want to go. Um, because, yeah, as we said, money's important, but it's not always everything, I suppose, when looking for a new role. Um, and I guess that ties in quite well if I just keep going, maybe Hannah, while I'm talking, I'm just conscious yeah, of time totally. with your resignation. Yeah, with yeah. your resignation, because obviously your counter offer will often happen at the same time as your resignation. Um, so beware, you will have that conversation. Um, but during your resignation, when you are telling someone you're you're looking to leave on, um, I think the key thing for us in this industry is we are a small industry in New Zealand. Um, you very often will work again with some of your managers. They might be on the same project for a different company. You might end up in the same company. People can sometimes use it as an opportunity to air all of their grievances. And I always say, not really. Yeah. It's not the best opportunity. You want to maintain a professional relationship. Um, you want to leave in good terms with them. Um, and you want to maintain that sort of relationship going forward. Um, obviously, it is an opportunity if you do have some sort of feedback you want to give, but ensure it's in a constructive a constructive way. Um, and the key things when you are resigning is just showing your willingness to continue working during your notice period, which is for most people a month, some people two weeks, um, and identify the sort of key things you're committed to delivering during that period. So you are leaving on good terms. So where you where you intend to leave a project what your intentions are with the project. Um, and it's always a good idea to um, have an idea in your head of who you would be handing over work to and offer to train different people in different areas if you're that specialist person so that you're leaving everything as well as you could. Um, and just on the formality side of that, I guess you do always need to hand in a resignation letter, uh, which needs to outline your final date. Um, you don't need to go too much into your reasons for leaving. Um, your resignation letter can just be sort of an intention of your leaving. And it's a really nice opportunity to thank the company for something they have given you, sort of be it the career mentorship, be it the support, be it the team, be it some project exposure you've had. Um, and yeah, and I think the key thing is just sort of keep working until that last day and enjoy your leaving drinks when you head off for your new adventure. <laughs> oh, I think that's a really good way um, to to finish off all of the advice you both have um, given today um, is just to keep it professional and you know make sure that because you're right in in this industry you probably will come across the same a lot of the same people and um, so I think that's really good advice and um, hey thank you both so much for taking time out of your day today to to join me on this episode of of industry insights I for one thought it was incredibly insightful um and just a really good overview of the things you need to consider when starting out as looking for a job, but also that potential mid-career progression. I think um, all of the stuff that you spoke about applies to anyone and everyone. So thank you both um, for putting that together for us. Um, as Laura mentioned, there is a Hayes salary, uh, salary guide, which we will send out to, to all the registrants today. And um, we spoke before, Amy, that I think Hayes have a lot of resources on their website. So please go check that out. And obviously, the services of Laura and Amy are also on that page. So 
yeah encourage everyone if you need some assistance with any of the stuff that was spoken about today please yeah, follow up with with amy or laura um thank you both so much um we will be having our next uh, episode of industry insights on the 9th of october and that will be uh, the launch of our um, project management scope of services document. So we have been working with um, PMINS um, to put together a comprehensive guideline uh, and will be joined uh, yeah, by members of, of the committee that put this together. So we're really excited for that launch. It's been a long time coming and um, yeah, hope to see you there. Please register through the website and until then, ka kite anō.